last week's sermon, we were learning how to stand in faith. We were thinking about the trials of life that we have to face and how those trials and those tests it can indeed test our faith to the maximum. Things like ill health, the death of a loved one, financial difficulties, family difficulties. And the list can go on and on. The trials that come our way. But what we've been learning here is that our Lord has given us tools whereby we can stand these trials, even grow stronger in our faith in the midst of such trials. That certainly was the case for the disciples. Jesus was shortly to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then, at the moment of that arrest, fear would overcome the disciples and they would all run away. Jesus would then die on the cross and their hearts uh, would be grieved. But on the third day, they had the joy of learning that Jesus had rose again from the dead and later would meet him and their faith would be restored. They had stumbled, but they did not fall. Why? Because the Lord had given them these tools, these promises that ultimately helped them to keep on believing in him. And it is like that for you and I. We have the same truths, the same promises. We will have the trials in our life, but we too, even though tested, can still stand. We noted that there are eight such truths or promises in these closing verses here of John 16. Last time we looked at the first four of those promises. We have, first of all, the promised help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to help us recall scriptures that we have learned, to bring them to our minds when we need them, and also to prompt us and direct us in the paths that we should follow. We can also be confident in our prayers. That our prayers are always heard and always answered. Because Jesus has promised it. Whatever you ask in my name. Thirdly, we have the assurance that our Heavenly Father loves us. Even though sometimes in the midst of our trials, we might indeed question our Heavenly Father's love. Jesus is telling us we have no need to do that. In fact, no right to do that. Because remember, God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And then finally, number four, we can know peace in the storms because of the surety of our faith in Jesus. Let's look at the remaining four today. And here is number five. Our hope is in the finished work of Christ. Our hope is in the finished work of Christ. Throughout John's gospel, our Lord uses a phrase. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. When we first read that, it doesn't immediately tell us exactly what Jesus is saying. He speaks of using 
figurative language. But let's ask, why did Jesus come from the Father? And of course, the answer is simple. He came to save us from our sins. Does that not bring you comfort? To know that Jesus actually came into this world to save you from your sins. He himself gave up his exalted position in heaven to come down to deliver us from the trials of a sinful world. But he continues and have come into the world. He came forth from the Father and have come into the Word. And that speaks of the actual saving work of Jesus. This is the work that he did. Living a sin sinless life and then dying on the cross. And you remember that as Jesus breathed his last he uttered those final words on the cross. It is finished. He had come with a purpose to save sinners. And as he died, he acknowledged he had finished the work. He had done what he came to do to provide the way of salvation but then he says, I am leaving the world again. And that is pointing us to the work that Jesus is now doing for us. When he ascended into heaven, he told the disciples that he was going to the Father. Why did he go to the Father? He went to be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He went to take up his position as our great high priest. Because today he sits at the right hand of God the Father and he intercedes for us. When we pray, we pray in his name. We pray through Christ, our great high priest. He is not only our high priest, but he is our king. He has all power and authority given to him. All things are under his control. So no matter what befalls you in life, it's not an accident. It's not bad luck. It is all part of God's eternal plan and purpose for you in your life. And it's all being worked out in fulfillment of Christ's finished work. And you see, when you think through these truths, when you think of how Christ came to the earth to redeem you, and how he completed, how he finished that work, so that you could have the possibility of dwelling with him in eternity, then look at the trials and look at the tests and the tribulations that you might face. And remember that all of that, it's all part of God's plan and purpose to redeem you. To make sure that you are able to go to your many mansion home in glory. It's so easy to allow our problems, our trials to cloud out the reality that we live in as Christ's people. Life is tough. There's no getting around that. Sometimes we have painful, hard experiences to endure. But what did Paul say about those painful, hard things? And, and when you look at his life, you know that he had lots of painful, hard things. He called them light and momentary sufferings. Because they were as nothing when they, they peeled into insignificance. When he looked. At his reward in glory. There are people who naturally have a tendency to crumble under the weight of trials or tribulations. But if you 
have a trial or a tribulation in your life. Remember these truths. Recall the assurance of Jesus that a better life is waiting for you because you are saved and safe in his arms. We are saved and safe because he has finished the work. He has provided salvation for us. Then we turn to the truth number six. We find solace in the abiding presence of God the Father. Here Christ continues to teach the disciples. In verses 29 to 31 as he speaks to them, they are stirred in their hearts to affirm their belief in Jesus. It's as if they think, well, you know, you're telling us about all these hard things, but, you know, we believe in you. And we know what Peter had to say, how he would even die for Jesus. But here Jesus asks a pointed question. He says, do you now believe or do you really believe? Oh yes, they did believe. But their belief was weak. It was defective. They didn't yet understand the nature of Christ's suffering, of why he had to die and so on. They were full of good intentions, but their faith was weak. And so Christ reminds them that an hour of trial is coming when they would all be scattered, when they would all forsake him. The disciples, you see, were going to trip up. They were going to stumble. When Jesus was arrested in the garden, they fled. Jesus was left alone. But he reminds them, I will not be alone. You will all scatter and forsake me, but my Father will be with me. And we must learn that truth, folks. Our Heavenly Father is always with us. There will be times in our lives when we feel lonely. I know how that feels. We may be forsaken by friends. We may be in a situation where no other believer is there to help. But we are never alone, really. Jesus says, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. What do you think Jesus would have chosen that he would have the company of all 11 disciples? Or the company of his heavenly father. Which would he have chosen? I have no doubt. He would have chosen the company of his heavenly father. You see. God alone knows. How to comfort us. In our deepest need. He's not affected by. The pain that we feel. The pressures we endure in life. He alone has the wisdom in every situation to handle it well. I was reading recently about uh, the great missionary Henry Martin. He joined William Carey in the work in India. Martin himself was from an affluent family and had had the privilege of a good education and 
Franklin University, he received the top grades and was offered a position in academia. He could have been a professor in the university. But instead, he felt the Lord calling him to go to work as a missionary in India. And in 1806, he arrived in Calcutta to work with William Carey. And he labored hard there, translating the scriptures into the local languages. Within two years, he had accomplished a major work in providing the scriptures in the Hindustani language. Then he turned his attention to uh, translating the New Testament into Persian. But then his health broke down and he was forced to return to England for recovery. He had left England alone. He was planning on marrying Lydia Grenfell. But he felt that he needed to get established in India first and then send for her. But his plans were crushed as Lydia's mother objected to her going to India. The two of them continued to correspond for the years he was in India. Often there were 15 months in between letters. But his love for her never dimmed and he longed for the day that they would be joined in marriage. So five years after arriving in India, he was made go back to England with his ill health. However, he was so sick that he couldn't finish the journey. And at the age of 31, he died amongst strangers in Turkey. He died alone. But he was not alone. A few months before his death, he had wrote to his beloved Lydia these words. Shall I pay in your heart by adding that I am in such a state of sickness and pain that I can hardly write to you? Let me rather observe to obviate the gloomy apprehension my letters to Mr. Grant and Mr. Simeon may excite that I am likely soon to be delivered from my fever. Whether I shall gain strength enough to go on rests on our Heavenly Father in whose hands are all my times. O oh, his precious grace, his eternal unchanging love in Christ to my soul never appeared more clear, more sweet, more strong. Whatever the trial. The Father's presence abiding with you as his child is stronger. Rest in his great presence. And so Martin died alone, yet resting in his heavenly Father's presence. We too are assured of his presence. Number seven, we see how to be calm in the storm. Jesus knew his disciples so well. He knew uh, that for them, their trouble was only going to get worse before it would get better. The storm of his death would cause them tremendous heartache. So here he seeks to give them a hope to cling on to in the midst of that storm. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. And Christ had spoken many things to them since they had entered that upper room. Remember, for example, how he had spoken to them the great promise of eternal dwellings prepared for them in heaven. He spoke to the disciples about the, how they had seen him, so they had also seen the Father. And he assured them that the Father would be glorified by the works that they would do in his name in the future. 
Surely that would help to calm their souls. Jesus also went on to reveal to the disciples the promise of the Holy Spirit. How it would come and indwell them and and teach them all the truths, helping them to recall the things that he had taught them. What an assurance to know that there would be help. Then he spoke to them about being grafted into the true vine. What a marvelous truth that in Jesus we have fullness of joy, love and the ability to be useful for him. The encouragement that knowing that even in our trials we can still be productive Christians. We can go on. But I think you get the point. Jesus has given them everything they need. That in the storm to come, It would calm their souls to know that Christ was indeed their saviour. Here Christ emphasises that peace is in me. Peace is in Christ. Paul picks up that theme in many of his letters. Time and time again he uses the phrase in Christ or in him. You see, folks, it is the strength of our relationship in Jesus that helps us to be calm in the storms. The peace that Jesus promises is not the absence of a trouble or trial. It's not even having a tranquility of heart and soul all the time. Leon Morris paints a good picture of what peace is. He tells of a painting that he uh, saw an artist paint. It was a picture of peace. But what did the artist paint. He painted a storm. A storm that drove the sea against a rocky coast. He depicted the waves, mountains high, crashing against the rocks. He put a shipwreck in that picture. A great ship driven up against those rocks and being broken to pieces. In the water nearby, there was even the body of a drowned sailor. Not much peace there. But he was making it obvious that there is a wild storm beating against the coast and that the storm means danger and even death. But in the foreground of his painting, There was a crack in a rock. And in that crack, a dove had nested and was sitting peacefully and secure on her eggs. And underneath, there was one word, peace. Peace in the storm. The crack in the rock. And folks, it is the positive blessings of God that give us peace in the midst of the storms. He is our hiding place. He is our rock of refuge. He is our shelter. He is our peace. Look to the Lord and he will be your peace in the storm. And then finally here, the eighth truth that Jesus gives us is blessed assurance. In those final words of this chapter, Jesus says, In the world you have tribulation, 
That is for sure. But then he continues, but take courage. I have overcome the world. When we begin to think of the pain and the suffering and the power of sin in this world, it can overwhelm us. It can make us feel gloomy and cast down. When we imagine all sorts of hard things that we may experience in this life, we may shudder. But the promise of Christ's comfort in the face of this is what should uphold us. He has overcome the world. This world may threaten us with tribulation. But as Christians, we live in the protection of our king. The king who has had the victory. His victory is our victory over the world. We rest in his conquering power. Nothing this world can throw at us can ultimately defeat those who belong to Jesus Christ. Nothing. No power. No force. No bad news. No nation, no law, no oppression, no sickness, no pain, no criticism, no persecution. The list can go on. For those of us who are in union with the conquering king, we are safe in him. Does that mean we will not be afflicted? No, not at all. But it does mean that in Christ, regardless of what we face, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Charles Spurgeon knew about the adversities of life. Though he was the most famous preacher of his day, he also suffered as a result. He faced opposition from his fellow pastors within the Baptist church, even being censured by them. He watched as the world heckled and made fun of him. His wife kept a thick scrapbook of articles written against him. And on top of that, he had a lot of physical illness and endured great pain. He faced depression, which probably arose from the stress that he was under. Yet in all of it, Spurgeon found refuge in the victory of Christ. A couple of years before his death, he addressed a group of pastors and he exhorted them to go on even in the face of adversity. Here are his words to them. You never met an old sailor down by the sea who was in trouble because the tide had been ebbing out for hours. No. He waits confidently for the turn of the tide and it comes in due time. Yonder rock has been uncovered during the last half hour and if the sea continues to ebb out for weeks, there will be no water in the English Channel and the French will walk over from Cherbourg. Nobody talks in that childish way, Spurgeon says. For such an ebb will never come. Nor will we speak as though the gospel would be routed and eternal truth driven out of the land. We serve an almighty master. If our Lord does not stamp his foot, he can win for himself all the nations of the earth against heathenism and whatever ever, or ever other ism you can think of. Who is he that can harm us if we follow Jesus? How can his cause be defeated? At his will, converts will flock to his truth as numerous as the sands of the seashore. Therefore, be of good courage, 
and go on your way singing and preaching. The winds of hell have blown. The world its hate has shown. Yet it is not overthrown. Hallelujah for the cross. It shall never lose. Rest in the assurance that Jesus Christ has conquered for us. Yes, we will face tribulations in this world. That's a certain. But God has given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us use these God-given grace-endowed resources to live for him each day. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these truths that we have been considering. These promises that you have given that can be our rock and our stay in the trials and tribulations of life. Our Lord knew that our lives would not be easy. He knew that we would face our tests and trials. But Father, we thank you for these encouragements that he has left with us. Help us recall them often and put our faith and our trust in him who has won the victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.